pre-flight one-on-one because they will give you wings. 6. Performance and Envelope Limitations Six point one performance takeoff and climb. Hey again, it's you and it's me. After completing the previous section of the course, you became familiar with the Cessna one seventy two, didn't you? You know about its development, you know about its design, and you basically know all about the systems, right? You also became familiar with manuals, flight planning. And basically how to prepare for a flight in this kind of aircraft. You're really getting closer to our goal, flying this aircraft. In this lesson, we'll be learning the limits of the aircraft and how the aircraft will respond if it's operated inside these limits. These are called limitation and aircraft performances. Let's begin with the performances of the Cessna 172 on takeoff and climb. Just as a quick reminder before we get into this nice chat we have right here in the right side of the screen. Um, go to your section 5 of your POH if you want to know more about um, performance. Okay, That's the section 5 of your POH, the level performance is where you can find more information about this. This first chart we are going to be taking a look at is the crosswind component chart. There are multiple ways of calculating the crosswind as you probably already know. We have formulas, sine, cosine. Well, in this part, I'm just going to be talking about the chart. Okay, let's try to understand this in a graphic way. So we have this example, the first example, example number one. We have this runway track 270. Wind is coming uh, from 230 at 15. We need to get the crosswind component and the headwind component for takeoff. So we are going to be using now this table to get it. First thing we're going to do is um, enter the wind speed in knots and the deviation from the runway track in degrees. This is going to be presented in red lines in the graph. Let's try and do it. First, the deviation between the runway 270 and the wind 230 is 40 degrees. So I'm going to be using that 40 degrees line. If you don't remember when uh, where a line is or where something is, the only thing you need to do is to read. Okay. First, we have here the angle between wind direction and runway. All these lines coming from the center are angles between the runway and the wind, in this case 40. Good. Now it says enter the wind speed. Okay, wind speed is going to be 15 knots. So the total wind speed are these arcs that are around. Okay, this is the arc for 15 knots, this is the arc for 10 knots. This is the arc for five knots. Okay, that is the total wind velocity as you have it here in knots. Okay. Now, second step, you're gonna draw straight lines to the side, horizontal, and down and up, vertical, to get crosswind components and head or tailwind components. This is gonna be drawn in blue. So we draw a horizontal line and we're going to get headwind, headwind, how much headwind? About 12, right? 11.5, something like that. Now we're going to draw another line down. What do we get? Crosswind component around 10 knots. And the third step is to read the results. We're going to be getting a value of 11 knots of headwind and 10 knots of crosswind. Easy, right? Now we're going to get it a bit more complicated. 
I'm going to give you a maximum headwind component limitation, a maximum tailwind component limitation, and a maximum crosswind component limitation. I'm going to give you the runway track, I'm going to give you the wind, and I'm asking for the maximum wind speed for takeoff allowed. So you have all your limitations and the wind is coming all the time from 2900 and you want to calculate what is the maximum um, wind speed that is going to allow you to actually take off. So let's see how this is done. I'm going to raise this real quick. Let's go. So how do we do this? First thing we're going to do is draw the lines from the limits. Okay, we want to draw our limits in the chart. We're going to draw this envelope, okay, um, with the three limitations with green lines. The first one is the crosswind component. My maximum crosswind component is 15 knots. So I'm going to be drawing a line at 15 knots. Next. My maximum headwind component is 25, so I'm going to be drawing a line at 25. My maximum tailwind component is 5, so I'm going to be drawing a line at 5. Okay, so we have this box right here. Okay, anything that is inside of this box is going to be allowed for takeoff. Anything outside of the box okay, is not going to be allowed for takeoff. So we need to know where our limitations is going to be. Now, next thing we're going to be doing is draw the line referring to the angle between the runway and the wind. The same we did before. In this case, the runway track is 270. The wind is coming from 230. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm reading the other one. The runway track is 240. The wind is 290. Therefore, the uh, change in this angle is going to be 50 degrees. Right there, remember? 50 degrees. Angle between wind direction and the runway. Next thing we're going to be doing is looking for crossing points. So, where does this line cross my envelope? It crosses my envelope right there. Okay. Boom. So the first thing, this crossing point is going to give us two values. First is going to give us the maximum wind speed. What is the maximum total wind velocity in knots? So wind velocity in knots. We are going to go to the circles, okay? It's not 5, it's not 10, it's not 15, it's 19 more or less, okay? So 19 is our maximum wind speed. For that wind direction and that runway with those limitations, 19 knots is the maximum I can allow for takeoff. Now, um, which of the limitations is limiting us. Crosswind, tailwind, headwind, what is limiting us? Exactly, crosswind, okay? The line, as you can remember from the beginning, that is actually crossing with the yellow line first is the crosswind component. So we are limited by crosswind. Now, let's imagine this uh, second example. I'm just going to be drawing it here real quickly, but it could also work. If I draw this line, which is going to be my first limitation? Exactly, tailwind. Okay. What about this line right here? If I follow this line, my limitation is going to be headwind. So with this and the tooth, we can move on to the next one. So the next chart we're going to be uh, taking a look at is the takeoff distance chart. 
the chart will be able to calculate how much runway we'll need for the prevailing conditions. First, we're going to take a look at how to read this chart, and then we will run an example. So, the important thing with these charts is actually being patient. We're going to be following uh, five steps. I always encourage my instructor, uh, sorry, I always, as an instructor, encourage my uh, students to uh, follow these steps through their examinations and also when they go preparing a flight because this is the only way to not commit mistakes. So, let's get started. These are the five steps I was talking about. The first thing you have to do when you uh, face this kind of table is reading the title and the subtitle. You will say, well, it's obvious that it's a takeoff chart. Well, we don't want to be using a landing chart for takeoff, okay? Um, that would actually not be safe. So we want to make sure we're using the correct chart. That's why we are going to be reading. In this case, for example, is short field takeoff distance at 2,550 pounds. So am I using a short field takeoff technique? Um, do I want to get the takeoff distance? Do I weigh more, uh, more or less than 2,550 pounds? I have to be taking that into account. Good. Second thing I'm going to be doing is reading and checking that the prevailing conditions match the conditions of the chart. Okay. Here are the conditions. Let's read them out. So it tells us flap 10, full throttle prior to black release, paved level, dry runway, zero wind, lift off um, at 51 indicator speeds in knots and speed at 50 feet above the threshold is going to be 56 knots of indicator speed so what this is saying is that if i do that if i do if i if i work under those conditions i'm going to get the results in the table or in the chart or in the graph if i don't these results will need some kind of modification okay so um always read the conditions that's going to give you a clue if you need to actually perform any correction as we will see later now step three the use of the table right there so um please as i said before steps one and two are important don't rush to read the table, I, I know I know a graph is nice. I know this thing is nice. I know you want to get uh, working quickly, but just give yourself those 30 or 15 seconds to read the conditions before you jump into the table. That's going to give you an overall better view and better situational awareness. So most important thing when you finally get to this part is to work with it. When we work with this kind of thing, we always work the most restrictive, okay? This means that we are going to be taking the value that gives us the worst performance. So imagine our field is at 3,400 feet of pressure altitude. Um, am I going to use 3,000 or am I going to use 4,000? Yes, exactly. I'm going to be using 4,000. Why? Because as you can see in the distances here, 4,000 gives me the worst takeoff performance, the longest distance. So I want to play it safe. I'm going to be taking 4,000. The same happens with the temperature. Um, today is uh, going to be, let's say, 4 or 5 degrees. What am I going to use? 0 or 10? Exactly, I'm going to be using 10 because the higher the temperature, the longest the takeoff run. Okay, so uh, I want to play it safe again. I want to be restrictive. I'm going to be using 10. Now, the fourth step is reading and using the notes as required. Um, as I said before, it is important to read step one, to read step two. But also, don't forget about steps four and five, all right? Um, don't jump out of the table or the graph and say, hey, I'm done. No, you're not. Careful, careful. Especially in exams, most of the exercises are going to be looking 
uh, to trick you on forgetting these things. So don't forget to read. Don't fail an exam because you forgot to read. And what is more important, don't crash an airplane or um, scare yourself when you're flying. Get out of your comfort zone or risk uh, your life because of not reading. Okay, that's what I'm trying to avoid here. So how do we read uh, these notes? We're just gonna start reading. Short field technique as specified in section four. So if I don't remember what a short field technique is, what section should I go to? Exactly, section four of the peerage. Prior to takeoff from fields above 3000 feet elevation, the mixer should be lean to give a maximum RPM in full throttle, static run up. Um, so basically, you have to lean the mixture in fields above 3,000 feet uh, to give the maximum RPM in full throttle. So if you don't do that, this uh, performance chart is not going to give you a real data. Okay. Number three, decrease distance 10% for each nine knots of headwind. Um, for operation of tailwind, up to 10 knots, increase distances by 10% percent for each two knots so for each nine knots of headwind we're gonna decrease the distance 10 percent for each two knots of tailwind up to 10 we're gonna be increasing the distances by 10 percent so here you see how bad tailwind is this is the worst thing you can encounter nine knots of headwind are only gonna allow you to reduce your calculations by 10 percent and only two knots are going to increase your calculations by 10%. So, um, if I have two knots of tailwind, that's easy. That's 10% more. Now, what happens if I have, um, let's say, eight knots of headwind? 10% less or no? No. We are using the most restrictive. So, if you have less than nine, I'm sorry, you don't get to re reduce your um, takeoff distance. Okay, so I think that's pretty clear. We want to be restrictive, we want to play it safe. Let's go to step number five. Step number five is basically reading again. Make sure you use the correct chart and make sure if there are more. Figure 5-5, short field takeoff distance. Heat one out of three, which means there are more, there are two more charts. So make sure that you're using the correct one. Maybe you don't have that weight. Maybe you are not at those conditions and you have more tables, more charts, more graphs to actually work with. Don't jump for the first one. You have more, okay? That's why the five steps are important. They are all going to give us um, an important input in actually making this uh, problem solving easy. Good. No questions. All right. Let's keep moving on onto the example. We're going to be running an example here. Pressure altitude is going to be 2,876 feet for the prevailing pressure conditions at that day. Um, the outside air temperature is going to be 25 degrees. That's a mild summer evening. Um, we're going to be getting the takeoff distance for flap 10, 9 knots of headwind, paved dry runway. So, as always, first thing we're going to be doing, reading. Um, short field takeoff distance at 2,550 rounds. Is this the correct chart? It is. Good. Conditions, flap 10, full throttle prior to click release, paved level dry runway, zero wind, lift off speed, and speed up 50 feet. Okay, so um, I do have wind, so I'm going to have to check that after. Um, I'm using flap 10, so that's good. And there's a paved dry runway. So yeah, the conditions are good for me. The only thing is that I'm going to be having to change that. Now, um, that already came up. That was my mistake. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Anyway, the pressure altitude was uh, 2,870 feet. As I said before, you're going to be using the most restrictive. So in this case, 3,000. 
and we are going to underline the 3000 line. Good. Next thing we are going to do is jump onto the temperature. So if we are 25 degrees, what am I going to use? 20, 30, 10? Exactly, 30, because it's the most restrictive. When they cross, we are going to be getting 1,410 feet for the ground rule, 2,520 feet for clearing a 50 feet obstacle. So this is our uh, um, takeoff distance. This is our um, runway run distance. Okay, this distance we're gonna cover over the, over the ground, takeoff run distance, um, and this is the takeoff distance. Okay. Um, is this our final number? No, we didn't finish the exercise. We are at step three. We didn't run through steps four and five. Let's get going with it. Notes. Short fill technique as specified in section four. Okay, I don't have to make changes for that. Prior to takeoff from fields above 3,000 feet, the mixture should be leaned to keep maximum RPM in a full throttle static runner. Mm, in my case, it's 2,876, so I don't have to correct for that. I don't need to actually use that anymore. Now, three, decrease distances 10% for each nine knots of headwind. For operation with tailwind up to 10 knots, increase distances by 10% for each two knots. In this case, as um, you can see here, we're using nine knots of um, actual headwind, right? Nine knots of headwind component. So what do I have to do? Yes, exactly. Nine knots of headwind is going to be giving us a... Uh, 10% decrease in both takeoff distances. Okay, so you would have to subtract 10% for this one and 10% for this one, and that would actually be your final takeoff distances. Okay, let's keep going with the notes. For operation on dry grass runway, increase distances by 15% of the ground roll figure. In this case, our runway is paved, as you can see right here. So we don't need to make changes here. So just adding that 10%, actually decreasing that 10% from this number and this number, you're going to be getting this final take of distances. Did we finish the procedure now? No. We need to check that we use the correct formula, that we use the correct graph, the correct table chart, whatever. Figure 5 and 5.5, show field take of distance, uh, 1 out of 3. Am I at 2,550 pounds? Yes. Then my calculations are correct. And that's basically how you're going to be doing this. Now, after calculating the takeoff distances, we are going to be taking a look at the climb performance. To begin with, take a look at this chart. Here we appreciate that depending on the speed and the altitude, we're going to get a different value for approximate climb rate and best rate speed. So um, for this one, I'm going to give you an example. But first, I want to uh, check that you learned something from the previous slide. So the title real quickly, maximum rate of climb at 2,550 pounds. OK, well, we, we are good with that. Conditions flaps up and full throttle. We know that if we want to get this performance, we need to be at flaps up full throttle. And we have pressure altitude that is going to give us a speed and that is going to be related to a certain um, temperature. So let's get using this chart. Example one, climb from 2000 feet to 8000 feet. The outside air temperature is going to be 15 degrees. Get the average rate of climb in feet per minute. OK. First thing I'm going to do, read. Second thing, read. Third thing, actually walk the table. So if I'm climbing from 2000 to 8000, I'm going to take um, 2000 and 8000. OK, I'm going to mark it from 2000 to 8000. This is the part of the chart that I'm going to be moving on. Now, 
Next thing I'm going to do is use the temperature. If I have 15 degrees, as we talked about before, what do I use? 0 or 20? I'm going to be using 20. Why? Because it's the most restrictive. So if I take 20, I'm going to get this, 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 and these values, which means at 20 degrees, when I'm at 20 feet, I'm going to start my climb at six, uh, 625 feet per minute, more or less. When I reach 400, my rate of climb is going to be decreased to 555. When I reach 600, uh, 6,000, sorry, my rate of climb is going to be about 450. And I'm going to reach 8,000 at a rate of climb of 300, uh, 345. In order to get what I was asking for in the question, the average rate of climb, you're going to have to do the average of these numbers. So you will have to add this, plus this, plus this, plus this, divided by 4, and you will get the average rate of climb in feet per minute. Now, in this last chart of this section, we'll get the figures for time, fuel and distance required to climb from and to a certain level for the prevailing conditions at the time. Okay. As always, I'm going to be starting with reading. Read, read, read. That's all you got to do. So, I'm going to read it real quickly. Time, fuel and distance to climb at 2,550 pounds. Good, perfect. Conditions, flaps up, full throttle, standard temperature. Uh, okay, standard temperature. Maybe my temperature is not standard. I'll, I'll have to see how I, I'll deal with that. That table seems to actually give you a pressure altitude like always. It's going to give us a speed. It's going to give us a rate of climb. And then it's going to give us from sea level. It's going to give us time in minutes, fuel used, and distance. Okay, um, yeah, we will have to see how to work with that. Now let's see the notes. The note says add 1.5 gallons of fuel for engine stats, taxi, and takeoff allowance. Mixture leaned above 3,000 feet for maximum RPM. We already know this one. Increase time, fuel, and distance by 10% for each thing degrees above standard temperature. Ooh. Okay, so if my if my temperature is higher than standard, I'm gonna be increasing everything by 10%. Um, if it's lower, I'm not gonna be increasing or decreasing anything. Why do you guys think this is? This is because lower temperatures is gonna allow us for a better real performance. So if we want to play it restrictive, we don't want to take that into account. So we only take things into account that are actually going to make our performance worse. The distance shown are going to be based on zero wind. Okay. Obviously, if you have a strong headwind, the distance in nautical miles is going to be way different. So you will have to apply that formula that we all learned in ground school about the actual ground distance related to the air distance. Um, or you can just use the time, the speed, and get the actual um, um, the actual distance. Anyway, let's get working the example. So, first thing, the title, we said it's correct. Second thing, the conditions, also good. I don't like that standard temperature. Let's look at the example. Climb from 2,000 feet to 8,000 feet, all right, out of their temperature of ISA less 10, so 10 degrees colder than standard atmosphere. So we are not at standard temperature. Therefore, we are going to be doing some corrections probably. Okay, we will keep working on that. And the question is, get the time, fuel, and distance to climb. So let's work with that. So we are working from 2000 to 8,000. The same we did before, we're just going to be taking the table. Okay. As you can see, the same way as before, this climb rate decreases with increasing altitude. And this speed also decreases with increasing altitude. That's the climb 
for uh, sorry that's the speed for maximum climb anyway the question is to get the time the fuel used and the distance in nautical miles let's see how to do it the first thing we have to do is what I did on the screen. We're going to be taking that square that is going to be getting from 2,000 to 800, uh, sorry, 8,000 feet. Next thing we're going to do is um, get that 2,000 data. Um, so 2,000 feet from sea level, it would take us three minutes, eight, uh, 0.8 gallons and four nautical miles to get there. But we don't want that. We don't, we, we actually want from 2000 to 8000, not from sea level to 2000. So let's see how we do it. Next, we're gonna be taking 8000. So from sea level to 2000, you are gonna be burning this. From sea level to 8000, you are going to be burning this. So if you want to get the data from 2000 to 8000, you need to subtract this minus this. I'm going to explain that. I'm going to make a little drawing right here. This is the C, okay? Um, this is 2000 feet. And this is, uh, let's draw in a different color. I'm pretty playful today. And this is 8,000. So, if from the C to 2,000, we are talking about three minutes, okay? This is three minutes. Um, from the C to 8,000, we are talking about 14 minutes. If we want to get the distance from 2000 to 8000 we actually have to get that difference in this case 14 minus 3 equals 11 minutes to climb from 2000 to 8000 feet good so once this is clear we can get the values for um, um, sorry for time for fuel used and for distance right so we subtract this by this one we're gonna get the time this from this one we're gonna get the time this minus this one we're gonna get the distance okay they will finish no we need to read the notes the notes are coming up add 1.4 gallons for fuel for engine starts taxi and takeoffs allowance anyway um, it doesn't really matter what I do. I need to add 1.4 uh, gallons for fuel for engine start. Second, make sure it's leaned above 3,000 feet for maximum RPM. Okay, I can do that. Increase time, fuel, and distance by 10% for each 10 degrees above standard temperature. Am I going to do a correction here? No, because my temperature is lower than standard so if the temperature is lower the performance is better therefore i don't have any correction four distances shown are based on zero wind do i have wind in my example no then my calculations are correct did i finish the exercise no i have the fifth step so these are the charts given for calculating performances at takeoff and climb as an activity for you to practice, I suggest you to try these calculations yourself. You can invent the data, you can get the data from the internet, from your current meter, from I don't know, whatever you need. But try these calculations on your own and you will get better and better every day. Keep learning, see you in the next section.